Peter Corbett met filmmaker Howard Jackson of Open Door Multimedia, totally by chance, on the 2nd of January 2019. As unlikely as it seems, Peter was sitting on a park bench behind St George's Hall in Liverpool. He was feeding the pigeons and eating a sandwich. Howard was wandering around the city taking street portraits. He had just acquired a new portable microphone and that meant that he had everything he needed to make a short film with Peter. There and then, without thought, planning or preparation. The film you're watching now was shot in Peter's home exactly one week after that first project. Tell me how it all started. Well, I went to Liverpool College of Art, um, the foundation there, I was accepted. Um, and it was a quite interesting time in Liverpool's history. It was about 1970. Um, and at that time, it was the back end of the 60s. So basically, you still had that feeling of the hippie period in the art college, but it was kind of moving away from it. But the tutors there were quite interesting. They were quite anarchic in, in many respects, um, particularly Henry Graham, the poet who did our humanities course, a really interesting guy. Uh, and my tutor at the college was Maurice Cockrell. Um, Maurice was very hard on technical uh, aspects of painting, drawing, you know, a really old school in a way. Uh, tutor. But that was really good. It gave me a great foundation for my work later on. Um, Sam Walsh was next door. He was another well-known painter. Uh, Arthur Ballard was international. He was the head of the foundation. Um, Pete Mosdale, John Bourne were there. So, I mean, in a foundation where you've got this wealth of talent, you don't realise at the time what a wealth of talent you have. I had there. It was amazing. Morris went on to become Keeper of the Royal Academy of Arts in London in the 2000s. So, you know, he was quite, quite a good teacher and painter as well, which is unusual uh, at that time. So it was a, an amazing atmosphere in Liverpool. Lots of things happening all, all around at the time. When you went to college, did you want the technical side or were you a free thinker and you just wanted to live and grow? Well... I was quite good in terms of being able to paint and draw technically, but as an artist, you know, that's craft. It's not being an artist. You've got to move on from the purely technical side. Although Morris was very good at the technical side, he also pushed us to move beyond that. So, you know, it was a growth period. And then I went to Manchester to do my degree in Manchester Regional College of Art. My tutor there was Brendan Nyland, who is, is well known now. Um, but it was that grounding in the technical ability that Morris gave me. So I could go to Manchester and it was a, a free, you do what you want for three years, which was great for me because I got the technical skill from, from Morris. And then my ideas came from, from myself and nobody stopped me from developing them. And at the end of the course, I was doing abstract painting anyway in oils towards the end of the course. But, um, I mean, obviously it, it developed later. And when you talk about the creative side, that side of development, where do you think that came from? Well, my mother used to paint. Um, my father played the piano. He was a doctor in Kirby. Um, and I lived in Kirby up till 1970. So it was an interesting background there as well. Um, my mother painted these beautiful flower, very tight figurative flower paintings. Um, and she always encouraged me to do that side of it, whereas my father wanted me to be a doctor like him and I rejected that and he wasn't too pleased with me being an artist at all. So I had to fight my corner for 20-30 years because he wanted first for me to be a doctor but then to, uh, to teach art, you know, saying that you can either te you can teach and you can do painting as well. Well, I used to say to my mother, no, you've got to focus on one or the other. You haven't got enough emotional energy to do two properly. So 
after my degree in Manchester, did a certificate in education in Manchester, and two weeks before the end, I realised that I wasn't going to teach. And so I went and did my own thing. I went to the lakes for a year and just kind of chilled out, did photos, walked, you know, just chilled away from all the educational system. Because I'd been in the educational system since the age of two. I was put in the nursery at the age of two. Then went to prep school and Liverpool College. And, you know, so I was in the education. So I just, I suppose now they call it a gap year, don't they? So it, it was my gap year, a year in the lakes. Um, and do you see anything of your mother's creativity in your own paintings? No, it was completely different. It was more, she painted more like the old Victorian illustrating uh, painters, more Aubondonesque in a way. Um, so no, my, my style is, is abstract oil painting. I mean, a lot of the influences I have were from Kandinsky. Um, his theosophical teachings I looked into in the 60s and 70s and his work was based on uh, theosophy, certainly initially, um, with Mondrian as well was based on theosophy and Malevich. In fact, theosophy influenced a lot of great, the greatest painters in the 20th century. And writers like W.B. Yeats, uh, Alexander Bloch, uh, and so on. So I don't think theosophy as a philosophy has been given the credit that it needs to with the foundations of the great modern uh, modernist movements of the 20th century. But I'm certainly influenced by theosophy and Taoism and Zen. Uh, I've always meditated since the age of 21. I've done meditation. So in a brief conversation I had with you recently, you talked about meditation. It's obviously been huge in your life. So can you talk about that a little bit? And maybe yes. How that's influenced your, your art? Oh yes, most definitely. Um, when I was in Manchester, I was had this old coat and clogs I got from Stockport. Bought the old wooden clogs in those days. And I was kind of, what, you know, what is it? What, what am I doing? Where am I going? You know, just kind of wandering about, not knowing which. And I saw these posters of this guru, Guru Maharaji, and I thought, okay, you know, I'd, I'd looked into a lot of the Eastern scriptures, for instance, the Hindu scriptures, the Vedas, Upanishads, the, uh, also the Quran. And I was searching for something more than the materialistic side of life. I'd, you know, um, so in a way I was, I was on the search and I thought, well, OK, I'll go and listen to this about this guy and see what happened. Anyway, I went to one of the meetings and they were playing guitars and everybody was happy and they were talking about this knowledge with a capital K that you received from Guru Maharaj's Mahatmas. And that was what, you know, the whole mysteries were about in ancient Egypt and so on. So, yeah, I, I said I wanted to get this knowledge. Um, and so I went down to London two weeks later and listened to people talk about this knowledge and then about, I was rejected at that time. So I came back, had a, a massive car crash which I nearly died in, um, coming back from London and then I realised that you know you could die just like that, so get this knowledge. So a week later I went back down, got knowledge and I've been meditating ever since. The four techniques that were shown to me were light, music of the spheres, uh, nectar, and the word. So those are the techniques I've been meditating on. So I've not gone into the drink and the drugs route that a lot of artists go into. I've kept high naturally with, the, with meditating on the knowledge. Something that interests me is that, as you said, the drink and the drugs influences, affects, damages lots of artists and musicians. Have you got experience in that, in people that you've associated with? Over yeah, because I had my own rock band from 83 to 85 called Aquarian. I used to knock around with people like Julian Cope from Teardrop Explodes, uh, Holly Johnson, uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, uh, Pete Wiley, Wah. So, the, we, you know, I used to go to Eric's Club in the late 70s, which was the main uh, focus of energy at that time. Um, so there was a kind of really interesting time at late 70s, early 80s. Um, Liverpool School of Dream and Pond with Peter Hagen was happening there. And I was working with Helen Prescott with a thing called Creative Mind in a massive warehouse where we put on um, 
independent underground films like Eraserhead with David Lynch. I think it was the first time that it was shown in this country and Creature from the Black Lagoon in Three Dimensions. So the whole ambience of that time was, was very creative. I remember saying to Pete Wiley at the time, there's something very unique and powerful happening here. We couldn't put a finger on it. But, you know, all the big bands came from that time, Echo and the Bunny Man, Teardrop, OMD, you know, um, uh, Lightning Seeds, all those came from that period. So it was a, a window opportunity that opens for maybe five or six years and then closes. And I was there at the right time. And I was there at the right time in the early 70s with the 60s. So, you know, I don't know whether it's Providence or whatever, but I was put in the right place at the right time for, a, for an artist anyway. And you came out of it all unscathed. Absolutely, because I could see, particularly when I was w with Aquarian from 83, 85, a lot of the other musicians were into drinking drugs. And, you know, you can produce one or two albums like that, but if you've not got an inner discipline uh, away from the drugs and the drink, you can't produce in a long period of time. You know, as I say, you produce one or two albums and you just burn out. Well, what the meditation did was I could go through all that, get all those experiences, but I didn't burn out, and I carried on doing the shows. I the last show I did with Aquarium was at the Otis Pool Peace Festival, and there was 50 bands over three days. Um, I, we had a laser show, and after it was a really great gig. And afterwards, I said, look, guys, I've got to choose between music and painting, and unfortunately, I've <laughs> just painting. The, all, the other guys had their own band and so on, so they could, they could go and do that. But I had to choose, and I chose the painting, and I, I did, did the right thing. So from then on, I did art exhibitions, you know, in New York, and uh, Florence Biennale, I represented the United Kingdom in 2007, did shows all over Liverpool and London and so on. So the, the actual painting side is very important. And the poetry side as well. I've always written poems. I've got about 2,000 poems now. So the poetry side is important. I'm doing a fourth book of poems um, soon called The Liverpool Dream. So hopefully that will come about this year. But they're, in a way, the meditation, it's like the fuel for the creativity. Because when you turn your senses inwards and tune into this energy, that's where the inspiration comes from. Inspiration comes from the Latin, inspiro, meaning in the breath. And if you turn your, your senses inwards, connect with this universal life force within you, it's very simple. It's not rocket science. You know, you quiet the mind. You don't speed it up. And you draw from this well. And it's infinite. You can draw from it all the time whenever you uh, meditate. So the theosophical and, and, and Taoist teachings gave a kind of intellectualized version of what I was doing. From the knowledge, I had direct experience of what all the scriptures were talking about. A direct experience. Not belief, not philosophy, a direct experience. So I could draw on that for, for the, the paintings and the poetry. So there is a more metaphysical bent to the paintings and poems than, than a lot of artists. But, you know, I've never gone into kind of commercial furrows or... You know, I, I've always ploughed my own furrow, you know. Being a painter and being a poet suggest an introverted personality. But the other side of it is going to New York, going to Europe, doing exhibitions, suggests a, an extrovert. So is there a balance there? Are you torn between the two? Not torn. I think they actually help each other. Because you do need a period of introspection to do the creative work but then you have to go out and show the work which is extrovert so you have to have a balance between the introvert and the extrovert side of you and touch wood I have that I think you know because when I'm with people I'm very extrovert you know but when I'm by myself I like period of quiet when I come into the flat I meditate for 10 minutes get rid of the worldly vibration and do the work so I centre myself every time I come in, every day, so that you're in that quiet space where you can do the creative work from. But that introversion, my dad was an extrovert, but he was slightly bipolar. He was, he was a GP himself. He knew he had bipolar. 
and he was either very up or very down. There was no kind of in, in the middle. So my mother was very introvert, quiet. So I have a bit of my father and a bit of my mother. So I've always had that dichotomy, which creates actually a vitality and energy. You know, if you're all introvert, you don't have the oomph to actually get the stuff out. If you're too extrovert, you haven't got the quiet to do the creative work. So actually that balance, 50-50, is actually quite good. You, know. you mentioned mental health issues there. Uh, and I just wonder, in your experience, how's mental health and creativity connect? And I'm not talking about yourself necessarily, but people that you've come across in your... Uh, and you're working and you're yeah, I mean, creativity is near madness and all that. Um, I think basically the brain is made of two hemispheres, the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere. The left is the logical side and the right is the intuitive, imaginative side. And what actually Jung was talking about was to balance the two sides, the anima and the animus, the male and the female. Um, and so what madness, I think, and schizophrenia is, particularly with a lot of creative people is they go too far into the right hemisphere and they're not grounded in the left hemisphere of the what what I call I am I, I call myself a practical visionary. One foot on earth practically, one foot in heaven with imagination, practical visionary. And usually what happens is you go from one extreme to another. They either go two feet into the right hemisphere up there, so you never produce any tangible thing art wise or you've too grounded and you don't have vision and imagination to produce the creative side of you so basically it's that balance again and the meditation again does that automatically it automatically balances me so if I'm flying too high the meditation goes oh I'll come down a bit if I'm too earthed it pulls me up so it's that nice middle way the Buddha's way, you know, path of moderation. But it's very rare that you get that, particularly in artistic people, because they tend to be obsessive, so they go to extremes. So they burn out. So you have a problem with creative people. They are the ones who really need meditation and to be grounded, actually. So touch wood, I've been guided to, to get the meditation and the knowledge, and that's helped me produce over a long period of time the creative work. At what point did you think you were, did you realise you were creating really nice material? Well, I was always reasonably good at the craft side of it. The, you know, I could, I could reproduce um, in pencil or paint, you know, the actual objects um, objectively very well all the way through. Um, but being an artist is something different than just being a purely craft person. That, I think, came after I discovered the double edging technique in August 1987, when I was in the studio in the basement. I actually was painting, I think it was Prussian Blue actually, and I knocked on the palette the white as well on the, on the brush, and I put it, the stroke on the painting, and it came this beautiful three-dimensional shape just in the wrong uh, the, the one stroke it's called volumetric form technically I, I learned later on but no one had done this technique before and I thought well this is unusual it's unique and I want to develop this and push this around and see what I can do with this and then it started happening the the paintings were Absolute. The, the early double edging is very crystalline and very intense and then it opened out and became less intense and more uh, open and it, it develops, it has a kind of mind of its own if you like. The double edging over the years has of, of, of kind of evolved um, to the point that now I, I, don't, I don't actually know what coming next it is sounds a bit strange I always me meditate 10 minutes before I paint and I clear my mind of thoughts I don't think the thing I have nothing planned okay so it's a kind of channeling in a way um, but that process of opening with no thought is important because something takes over and it does actually 
It's a power that takes over. And you can see yourself doing this. And afterwards, you look back and say, how the hell did I do that? It's the same with the, po the poems. I write between 1 and 2 o'clock every morning. Quiet. That's the time I write. And something takes over and it goes... Duh, duh, duh. And later on, the next day, my logical mind comes in and all I have to do is do a few punctuation changes and the odd word and it's there it's done so there is a kind of channeling process i presume if you get into or what they call the zone now, um, that is where that comes from the reservoir of creativity if you like mm. but you need to know how to connect with it and if you've got a speedy mind you tend not to be able to connect with that so you've got to have this inner quiet well i do anyway some artists like speed but i can't create you know, unless I have that in the quiet. <clears throat> and that technique of double edging, is that the word you use? Double edging, double yeah. Edging. Has that influenced others since you started doing it? No, I think it's so unusual that if people started copying, it would be obvious where they got it from. Mm -hmm. So it would be pastiche of, of what I'm doing. So nobody actually touched wood, I think, has, has actually developed from it. There are certain people who have tried to do it without the double edging, which is similar to what I'm doing, but they're not, not copying, because it's so obvious. It, 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 it's such a, um, a unique technique. If you start copying that, you know exactly where you've got it from. You know. So yes, that, that, that is unusual to find a new technique in contemporary art. And I like to be quiet. I've never pushed it. I've always been in the background. I don't like art cliques. I don't like necessarily the art international markets, all that kind of stuff. I do my shows quietly, do the work, got the body work together. I've got 150 songs, 2,000 poems, and 300 paintings. So I've been able quietly to get those together over the years. Whereas if I was speeding around, in the national international art world, I probably would never have produced very much. Having said that, you've obviously done some speeding around in the international art world. So yes, I I have done shows. I did two sh uh, mix shows in New York. Um, one mix show in Barcelona, uh, Florence Biennale, as I said. Uh, won the Europe uh, Lexmark European Art Prize Northwest winner. Yes, and, and shows in London and so on. But I've never been kind of brought into the vortex of the the media spin, you know, because it sucks your energy. Your energy comes from here. It's called Hara, your creative centre. Martial arts artists use it. And if you get into the world too much, it takes the energy away, it saps your energy and will. And that's unfortunately what happens to a lot of artists. And if you're drinking and taking drugs, that saps the will again. So you don't produce the work. And so you just burn out and go down the spiral. But I, because of uh, Marashi's meditation, I've been able to keep above all that, maintain a reasonably balanced high so that I could actually produce the work in over a long period of time. So where it goes now, I don't know. I don't really care for, you know all the big fame nonsense and all the rest of it. I'm not, I, the, for me, success is producing an authentic piece of work, whether it be a painting or a poem, not with a how much money I have. I've always been poor. I've always lived on very little, except for seven years when I had a small inheritance, so I could do the large 10-foot and 8-foot canvases at the Blue Coat. But otherwise, I've, I've, <laughs> in, the, in the 80s, I was so poor, I had to, I had to buy hardboard because I couldn't afford the canvases. So there's a lot of 2x2 uh, two two and 2x3 two paintings in the 80s on hardboard. But, you know, um, from 2000 onwards, the big uh, major paintings I did, you know, the Blue Coat Studio. So, you know, I was at the peak of my art, my, my potential anyway, it was 48. So it came at the right time in a sense because if you you in a develop. I, I remember saying to Morris, well, Morris said to me, he said, you know, Peter, it's better if you make it, whatever that means, uh, later on in life, not early, because you're then internally strong and mature to deal with what happens when fame comes. And it's true. You know, it's better to 
if you do so-called make it, better to have it later on. And you listed a big output just a few minutes ago. So what's the legacy? What happens to that output when you aren't here anymore? Well, um, my archive is in the University of Liverpool. They've taken, like, there's seven paintings in their collection, but all the notebooks, a lot of the drawings, a lot of the photographs, bio, catalogues, are all at the University of Liverpool in the Sydney Jones Library now is for the catalogue, my archive catalogue. So a lot of, when I pass on, a lot, the rest of the archive, most of the archive actually is there, but the rest that I've not given them will go to the University of Liverpool and some more paintings. But I think the paintings will be given to the Contemporary Art Society. They are the ones who distribute paintings to public art collections. I mean, I don't sell paintings now. Um, uh, I don't need to really, I'm retired so I live on a state pension and, and that's all I need now, I don't need very much, I've always lived on very simply so when I had the pension that was great, first time I had kind of money you know to, to actually spend on art and whatnot. so that was great. You touched on not knowing what the future will bring, so what do you think it might bring? You just don't know, I mean I, I may have a show at Seton Hall in Yorkshire for six months this year if uh, the owner gets a reasonable tranche of money he's, he's going to create a 90-foot wall for the paintings to go on. Uh, he's already opened it, there's a cafe there and a beautiful 40-acre garden and so on. Uh, he was one of my early patrons who bought two 10-foot canvases, William Kidd, and he has been supportive of me, you know, one of the few patrons. Um, so hopefully that shall come on. And then um, the Liverpool Dream uh, poems, I'll probably do another 80 like I did with Shambhala and New Revelation, which is the third book of poems I did two years ago. So there'll probably be 80 poems in this, about, mainly about Liverpool, obviously, this time, uh, rather than or the esoteric side, the metaphysical side I did with Shambhala. But uh, the Liverpool Dream would be more uh, about Liverpool and my experiences in Liverpool. Because in a sense, I do... Um, remember all the history of, uh, of the time when Eric's happened in the 80s. And so it is quite um, interesting as a history, the creative history of Liverpool. So obviously I'm part of that. Looking back, is there anything that you would have changed? No, you can't regret anything. Because every experience, both negative and positive you have, feeds into the creative unconscious. And all those so-called negative experiences when I was on the road in London, like George Orwell in Down and Out in London and Paris. Uh, actually, George Orwell had a publishing deal. He knew that he had money at the end of it. I didn't. I was on the road, you know, in London and sleeping in the East End. Uh, came back, slept on the stone line in benches and St George's Hall before getting the worst flat in Liverpool in the worst time in Liverpool's history in Windsor Towers, 14-storey tower. Um, I mean, it was just... And at that time, I wasn't speaking to my parents. I didn't speak to my parents when I went to Windsor Towers for 15 years after that. We had a blow-up. I was ranting and raving about capitalism, how middle classes were, you know, this, that, the other. So it was that kind of period in the 70s. So I didn't speak to them for 15 years. But then, in the early 90s, we got back and I looked after them for seven years, both my parents, before they died. So it was like the prodigal son, really, in many ways. But they still never accepted I was an artist. They still never accepted that. I had to fight my corner all the way through my life and with my brothers as well. So it's, it, it, artist life is not easy. People think you just sit around painting in your studio. Psychologically, it's difficult in a consumer society to maintain your authenticity um, and that simple spiritual life. It's very difficult, but rewarding if you can do that. Okay. Now just as a final point, you've talked about living in poverty, uh, you're now living on a pension mm. in a, what I would describe as a very nice flat in a very nice part of Liverpool. Is poverty and sort of discomfort and 
relative comfort. Are there different influences on creativity? Yeah, they're kind of like a dynamo. I think you do have to go through, um, what they call it suffering, but you, you have to realise what real poverty is. I mean, I, I didn't know, you know, sometimes I was living on brown rice for two or three days because I didn't have money for food. Literally, literally hungry. Most people nowadays don't know what it means to be hungry. You know, in the 80s, I was, you know, three days before, you know, I, I had money. So until the early 90s, I was living on less than 50 pounds a week. That's a quarter of what the poverty line is. A quarter. So, you know, in a way, coming from that, doing even the creative work, because I could afford the hardboard in the 80s and stuff to paint on, and then getting the inheritance, which is only small inheritance, but it just flowered because, or had all the experiences there. First time in my life I had money to spend on, on uh, proper food and, you know, canvases and stuff. So for seven years I had that flowering with the big paintings. That's where all the big paintings came from. Um, I mean, I do four foot by five foot now. That's about, emotionally I can cope with that. Not the big paintings anymore. Um, but yes, you need, the, you need to um, not just intellectually know what poverty is. You've got to directly experience it. And I did for 15, 20 years in some of the worst conditions in Liverpool in the late 70s. So it was pretty hard to go through that. I look at this meditation as a life tool. It's not mumbo jumbo or airy fairy. It is a life tool. And that's what got me through. So, yes, you do need those two experiences, the light and the dark. It's like a dynamo, you know, the yin, the yang, you know. And you need that as someone who is cutting into new areas of the psyche or breaking down the box, as they call it. So you need that meditation to guide you. Once the boxes sides are broken down because there's no one to tell you where to go or do you're just in this infinite space and you're what am i doing so you need an inner compass and that's what the meditation gave me and a lot of people a lot of artists tend to not have that so they go in the rocks all the time and they go downhill but thank god i suppose it's it's grace or fate whatever it's called i got the knowledge when i was 21 and that was my inner compass really so all the work stems, either consciously or unconsciously, from that and developing my experiences in Liverpool, which are like amazing. My whole life has been like a film or a series of films. It's, it's amazing.